Yes, I think through my experiences at those intersections of sex and magic, so through, you know, journey through conscious sexuality, uh, as it's often termed, I have encountered, um, I experience, I feel, uh, I am multiplicitous. And I, I experience this nowhere more fully than I do in sex and in relating. Mm. Yeah. Hello and welcome to the Fifty Shades of Gender podcast. We get curious about all things gender, sex and sexuality, as well as relationships, feminism, the inclusive kind, mental health and kink, and all that makes us humans unique and diverse. From body positivity to body dysmorphia, it's all welcome here. If you like what we do and want to make a contribution, you can become a patron on Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender, or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. Now join us on a journey of inclusion, acceptance and respect. I'm your host, Esther Lemons. I am a cis queer woman and my pronouns are she and her. In this episode, I have a conversation with Rowan Bombadil, a psychosexual coach and interfaith minister dedicated to bridging the binaries between sex and spirit. Rowan's pronouns are they, them and their, and they are a genderqueer shapeshifter and sex witch. Find out what that means to Rowan in this episode. We also talk about deconstructing boxes and binaries, the link between gender, sex and magic, reclaiming the body and revealing more of ourselves, roleplay versus shapeshifting, multiplicity and spanning the gender spectrum, transformation through intention and celebrating the sacred in ourselves. To clarify some terminology that is used in the episode, GSRD is Gender, Sexual and Relationship Diversity. Rowan is offering listeners a special seasonal gift, a short solstice ritual in the form of a beautiful guided meditation for greeting the dark with an open heart, near the end of the episode. We start setting the scene about 52 minutes in, and the ritual starts a few minutes after that, and lasts about 20 minutes. If you'd like to join in, please make sure you have a candle to hand, something to light it with, and something to put it in or on. Ideally, you would have access to a quiet, safe, sacred space with lights dimmed or off. Alternatively, you can of course save it for when you are free to take this time for yourself. The meditation is available as a separate mp3 download for our patrons and supporters. It was recorded on the 16th of December 2021. Now let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome. What's your name? Hello, my name is Rowan and I use they them pronouns. Hello Rowan. Well, let's talk a little bit about gender as we tend to do. In this podcast and um, you've given me some really fascinating labels and I'm just really excited to get into them what I have here is genderqueer shapeshifter and sex witch let's start with the genderqueer and the shapeshifter mm-hmm. where did okay. that come from yes absolutely so I can start with those I I like queer I'm I'm one of those people who just likes enjoys queer as a catch-all mm-hmm. and for me I think what, and it's in its essence, what queer means for me is it's this sort of acute question mark emblazoned on my soul. You know, Ooh, it's this. I love it. Um, yeah. Yeah, this acute question mark. Maybe it has some wings. Maybe it has some wings, and those wings are constantly sort of battering at anything that looks like a box or a binary or you know it's Mm. there's this constant sense of uh, wanting to question or deconstruct or fuck with uh boxes Mm. and binaries and so I think that's the that's the sort of internal experience and then externally I think of it as this invitation to to look deeper Mm -hmm. to see each other with fresh eyes to look closer, to look deeper, yeah, to see each other beyond the preconceptions that our culture really encourages us to look at each other through. I think queer, yeah, is a really beautiful invitation to set those aside and see the person. Yeah, see the mm. person or the creature who is who is in front of us. Yeah, I love that. That feels very mystical. Almost, you know, yeah. Oh yeah. dear, I've gone there already. 
<laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so tell me a bit about your how you discovered what you've just beautifully described that queer means to you. You know, what's your journey been like? So I was I was thinking about this. I've been reflecting on this because I knew you were going to ask me that question. And mm -hmm. inevitably I I know the first thing I notice is that I'm reaching for meaning, right? I'm reaching to construct meaning. I'm reaching for a nice clean narrative and story to be able to tell you. I think I've still got those queer gatekeepers <laughs> in my head who want a, a yeah. particular kind of arc um, mm. or narrative or story to yeah. my gender journey. And, you know, it, it, immediately it's, it's yeah, I, I don't have that arc. And I think mm -hmm. one of the reasons I don't have that arc speaks to the way that queer identity um, in the sense that you and I are, are probably most often talking about it intersects in very particular ways with class, culture, education, language. Um, mm. And the reason that I'm saying that is because I, I am British. God, it feels like a dirty word these days, doesn't it? My goodness <laughs> me. I'm just like, I don't, don't, don't want it to come out of my mouth. Um, yes, I'm, I'm cool. um, a recovering <laughs> British person. Anyway, I am... <laughs> originally British but I didn't grow up yeah. in England I grew up in a country that as far as I'm aware still doesn't have a word for queer um, I think one of the unfortunately uh, a really kind of easy way to describe this is uh, about oh I don't know five years ago now maybe I had a chat with an ex-partner of mine um, from that country Mm -hmm. So the last person that I was with before I came back to England and, you know, he was asking me about my life and asking me about my nesting partner. And I was describing my nesting partner in very warm terms and describing the fact that he's queer and how great that is for me. And my ex was kind of like, what is that? And so I was trying to explain. And at some point he cut me off and he said, look, over here, you're either a puff or you're not a puff. Is he a puff? And if he's a puff, what is he doing with you? Like that was, yeah, that was the culture mm. that I grew up in. And I grew up in a very tiny pocket of that culture on an island that had 3,000 people in the summertime. So mm. I think, you know, the first thing that I notice if I'm, if I'm trying to reach back for a, a narrative about my gender journey is that thing around, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And even more so, if there isn't, if there isn't a concept in the culture, in the collective, in the community that you're inhabiting, mm. how do you be, how do you become that thing? So that's the first thing I noticed that I can't provide a nice clean arc of queerness. You know, the the right coming out story or the right finding my community story because mm. those things weren't there. And you know, I can pinpoint moments. I can recall moments of uh, wanting or even actively choosing to, shall we say, cross-dress, uh, or the fact that when I first started cutting my own hair, the person that I most wanted to look like was Kurt Cobain. Or further back than that, this word tomboy, which I had encountered when I was still very small and before we left England, and which I'd, I'd somehow wished had been bestowed upon me, and I saw it very much as this sort of gift that other people had to bestow upon one. Um, although goodness knows whether, in the context that I heard it, it was originally intended as a gift. So yeah, moments moments like those, there are a plenty, and I wasn't straight. That I mean, that much was clear, uh, and there was enough cultural understanding and language, still very binary language, but nonetheless uh, available around that. Um, although again, within the context that I'm growing up in, I know this is familiar for many people uh, within many different contexts, but usually encountered in the form of a slur, right? Uh, I don't know, I don't recall when I first encountered words like bisexual, which is probably a word I kind of reached for fairly early on, um, whereas now I might, if, if pushed, I might reach for something like pansexual. 
what I can say, and this kind of becomes very clear once my gender journey does begin in a more explicit way, what I can see is the way that gender, sexuality and magic have always been inextricably interlinked for me. And whilst mm. I didn't have access to gender diversity, and I mean that in the sense of, you know, resources, community, voices, whatever, modes of expression, I did have access to sex and magic. And those two things emerged for me around the same time. So my, my single parent was a very early adopter of the internet. And I can still remember the day when I was doing something on the internet. And I found a spell and something in me went, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it was real. <laughs> um, Amazing. Yeah. So then we, we visit England shortly after that. And I go into a bookshop and I come out with a stack of books on witchcraft. And so around the same time that my sexuality, my erotic self is emerging, my my witchy self is also emerging. And in fact, I reflecting on this, I remembered a time when my then my first kind of serious and in, in the sense of um sort of sexually active partner had come to visit and I said actually I, I need the bedroom for a little while and I went off because I'd found in one of these books a self-initiation process and so I was taking time out of our time together to go and um initiate myself as as a witch uh, so those two things, those emerge mm. simultaneously. And then later on, those same threads, that, that sense that I, yes, yeah, so I was very lucky with some of the literature that I was reading, because I know now that this could have very much gone the, in the other direction. But I was very lucky, lucky that the literature on magic that appealed to me was often very sex positive, very explicitly sex positive, and brought mm. in tastes of how ritual and the erotic might come together. So I was very lucky in that sense. So my own innate sense that sex had, had a power, had a mysticism, had a capacity to heal me to allow me to feel more whole or to have transcendent experiences that innate sense in me was being reflected and encouraged by the literature that I was reading um, shout out here mm -hmm. to Francesca de Grandis and Fiona Horn I think were two of the people that I came across quite early on both mm -hmm. kind of quite explicitly sort of sex positive voices and so that link is doubtless part of what made me then prick up my ears one day went back in England now at Oxford University that's what kind of brought me back um I'm listening to uh Hay House Radio because I'm I'm a burgeoning hippie what are you gonna do um I'm listening to <laughs> Hay House Radio yep. and yeah on comes Barbara Corellis talking about her book urban tantra and something mm -hmm. something in me sort of pricked up its ears and went oh that might be useful you know that might be useful with clients say because I was already spending my prodigious grant from the university on alternative therapy courses at the weekends um, <laughs> so nice. I get this book and I have that sort of real sense of recognition and where this is leading is that there are two places really in which my gender journey finds permission to unfold and um, take wings so to speak and one of them is through that work and through mm -hmm. the community around urban tantra and mm -hmm. everything that that everything that that community gifts me with that's the word I'm going to reach for everything that community gifts me with I am so profoundly privileged I thought about this recently as a sort of second coming of age I really hate coming of age films and I think the reason for that is because when I was coming of age I was dealing with xenophobia and being required to kind of be an adult 
you know, I look at coming of age films and I, I just think, wow, that was nothing like my experience. Mm -hmm. But I did get to have a second coming of age really through that work. And I got to be raised by extraordinary queer pioneers whose mm. work and uh, ferocity and love and heart really spoke to m the ways that my innate sense of sex, magic, social justice, yeah, really spoke to, to those senses in me and, and helped me give them shape. So that's mm. one place that my gender journey is able to sort of go back and forth and then arrive at a place of bothness and then arrive at a place of multiplicity, which is perhaps where I feel myself to be now. Mm. And the other place is is in relationship. So again, that, that sort of connectedness of, of sex, intimacy, magic, and gender. And that it's not until I have a partner who is attracted to me and loves me, not in spite of my gender diversity, but because of it, mm -hmm. that I'm able to really expand, breathe, uh, live in to yeah, to the multiplicity of myself, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I love that word, multiplicity. Should we dig into that a little deeper? When it comes to gender, although I know you said like there, the, all these facets are interlinked and you can't really separate them. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like in, in your experience of gender? So I think my experience, I'm very much not on the a gender spectrum if that makes sense it's more my experience is more that i have an internal <laughs> an internal plurality or, or my gender contains multitudes if you like um in that yeah it's more that it's more that my experience spans the spectrum or alights on a number of different places of the spectrum or you know moves off the spectrum Yes, I think through my experiences at those intersections of sex and magic, so through, you know, journey through conscious sexuality, uh, as it's often termed, I have encountered, um, I experience, I feel, uh, I am multiplicitous. And I... I experience this nowhere more fully than I do in sex and in relating mm. yeah that makes so much sense really doesn't it yeah mm. and it's a tricky one isn't it because I so I run GSRD gender sexuality and relationship diversity sessions for both the interfaith foundation that ordained me and and for a couple of other charities and you know, inevitably have to take time painstakingly explaining that gender does not equal genitals, gender and sexuality are separate things, you know, really mm -hmm. having to do that work of passing things out. And there's that, there's almost that sense of, and here I am messing it up again, right? Because they are, yeah, yeah they are so inextricably linked in a way. Me. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And but it's the, good to like pick it apart first, yeah. isn't it? To make yeah. sure that you understand there's these different facets, but they make up the whole yeah. of us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, so there is nowhere I experience the multiplicity of myself more clearly, or nowhere that I have as much opportunity to inhabit the different aspects, the different shapes of my gender as I do in sex and kink and relationship. Mm, and for yeah. me particularly actually when I'm talking about kink um because I do a, a fair amount of talking about kink and spirituality and kink um in relationship to self-actualization mm. and one of the great gifts that BDSM play has to offer us for me is that explicit invitation to inhabit aspects of ourselves that um, perhaps don't fit within uh, the narrow kind of definition of values of our culture um, mm -hmm. or our cultures, as the case may be, 
or are in one way or another not welcome in our daily lives and the sense of the sense of fullness the sense of wholeness that being able to inhabit those aspects of ourselves and be celebrated loved witnessed seen desired within them can mm. can engender yeah amazing yeah I was led to another question kind of following on from this. Like, obviously in all this, the body plays a major role, let's mm. put it that way. Yes. So how do you feel about your body and has this changed over time? Because in your book, which we'll get to, mm. uh, one thing that really stood out for me is talking about reclaiming the body. And mm -hmm. I thought that was a really beautiful way to put it. So how does that all fit together for you and gender? Hmm, I think maybe this takes me back to um, the word shapeshifter, mm. which we were touching on earlier. And again, acknowledging, yeah, acknowledging the extraordinary privilege of having, having had access to magical, sacred, whatever you want to call them, practices, Mm -hmm. at the time when I was emerging into my erotic self. Mm -hmm. I consider myself very, very fortunate in that sense. But the reason that I use the word shapeshifter, it speaks to the fact that I use energy and magic to support me in inhabiting those different aspects of myself. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes, sure, sometimes that's more of a an internal process, a process of putting my attention in a particular place or seeing pretty lights or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. But it can also be a very felt physical process in the sense of, for example, uh, connecting with or crafting different genitalia mm. or different physical shapes. So mm -hmm. shape-shifting in that sense of becoming of becoming a, a different felt shape, whether that's an augmentation of my body or my genitals or even shifting into something that feels like a different species. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm that's that's why the word shapeshifter, because that is using energy, intention, attention in particular ways, allows me to embody those different gendered possibilities or differently mm -hmm. gendered possibilities within me mm. yeah I like that we touched on that in actually episode six of the podcast Sophia mm. was talking about yeah I think she referred to it as having a light cock that's what mm -hmm. she said yeah you know yep. so yeah and, and I find energy that fascinating. fuckery as I call it <laughs> yeah that's yeah. such a fascinating thing to me and I think maybe what people are thinking now is maybe like role play or like gender role reversal, you know, which is obviously a very binary term. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. But it's like, it's more about just that all comes from such deeply conditioned cishet normativity, you know? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's interesting. The word role play has never resonated with me in terms of my own either my own experiences or my own desires um so Interesting. what I'm, why is that yeah <sighs> i think the challenge for me is always what i'm interested in for myself and, and probably in my work as well is always how do we reveal more of ourselves rather mm -hmm. than how do we find another way to please perfect perform play act role play Right. I think yes. that's what it makes me think of. Yeah. And when I'm talking about shape shifting, it's much more about how can I use these techniques? How can I use breath, energy, attention, intention to more fully inhabit and express a part of myself, uh, a part of my experience that feels very real to me? That, that is my mm. experience, that is a felt thing. How can I use these tools to help me more fully flesh that part of me out, quite literally? And yeah. ideally share that with, if I'm, if I'm being uh, kinky or sexy with someone else, share that with them 
right? Mm. And I, I remember the moment in my gender journey where I sort of got to the point where I was like, okay, if someone can't see the fullness of my gender, I probably don't want to be having sex with that person. And I think I might also say mm. if someone can't taste my magic, probably, probably not that interested Ooh. in having sex with that person. Yeah. If someone can't share that with me. Wow. Can't like see that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. I love that. Yeah. That's really interesting because obviously I think when people think about role play, mm-hmm. it is a very, like, it can be, because I think sex in our society is very performative based yes much too much so yes um and then maybe role play is like playing with different ways to again perform as you were saying whereas for you it's more completely the opposite yeah it's just becoming more of you rather than less of you and embodying really embodying that I love that yeah yeah Mm. I wish I could remember the fullness and and the language and perhaps you will be able to of that uh, model of thinking about the erotic and why we have sex and I can remember three things and one is connection one is transcendence and one is role play Mm -hmm. and I would say for me when I'm talking about those shape-shifting experiences I don't see them in the third category I probably Mm -hmm. see them in the transcendence category that makes sense. That yeah. would probably be the closest thing. Um, although, yeah. as I said, I also want them to augment and be part of the connection as well. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, it's more like an exploration of self rather than trying to find something outside yourself to yes. play with. Yes, although I am sure that role play for many people is a gateway mm. into Yes. Finding and expressing facets of themselves that have not previously had permission to come forward, right? And in that sense, totally. really celebrating yes. it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's she- so interesting because I can imagine, like, you know, even the term cross dressing, I find it kind of amusing because, you know, what does that even mean? But, like, <sighs> someone maybe if if to be binary about it if a man maybe is experimenting with taking on more of a well opposite again it's just so Mm -hmm. weird to even talk about it in this way but like role playing in in that way and Mm -hmm. then realizing like oh my goodness this actually feels like really affirming rather than Mm -hmm. just something kinky to play with you know yeah nothing wrong with role play and kinky stuff of course i think it's great for people to explore facets of their identity in different and unconventional ways so we just talked a little bit or touched on your book. Yeah, which is a, you call it a playbook. And I do. yeah, it really is that. And there's so many juicy exercises in it. So this is like, I take it like a culmination of all the work you're, you're doing and have done with people. How do you feel? I mean, where does, where does queerness do you feel come into your work with others as well? I think I touched earlier on that sense of coming into this work or maybe, I don't know, doing my apprenticeship, if you like, within Urban Tantra, which is such a gloriously diverse and deviant world and is held in such a queer way. And I think, you know, I know that Barbara's intention setting out was to create spaces where she could meet her own queer tribe but then I think the the teams that have followed on that have held have supported her in that work have only added to that and added to that intention there's in terms of my sort of origin story that environment and the values that underpin that environment the people that that environment attracted really resonated with the ways that my own sense of social justice and sexuality and gender were kind of all percolating within me. So there's a very clear sense in me very early on about who I particularly wanted to work with. But one choice that I have made over the years uh, is to, particularly when it comes to events, you know, those things that used to happen in the before times, (laughs) 
I, I've made, I've, yeah, I've made a choice and it's become an increasingly intentional choice that those spaces are queer celebrating, but not queer exclusive. Mm. I think that started out probably just from a perspective of, at the time, not having only queer clients and probably wanting my clients who were not queer to be able to access the events that I was running. Mm. But it's my sense of the value of it has strengthened over time. Not, I hasten to add, because I think that there should not be queer exclusive spaces. Goodness knows my my little queer creature self really needs those. Um, mm. But because of what I see happen in those rooms, I'm, I'm thinking the, the one that always comes to mind for me is this particular event we always start with names, pronouns, and desires, and we're going around the circle and we come to someone who is presenting as a cishet guy whose first language is, is not English. Uh, I think he's visiting. He's visiting England at the time. And he's sort of going, what is, what is this pronouns thing? In a way that, you know, is, is a, little, a little flag, right? Especially in a, in a space where we're kind of, very carefully curating the space to be one of safety, permission, celebration, joy for our fellow queers, right? So there's that little flag mm. goes up about this person. And then much later in the evening, one of the hottest things that's happening in the room is between him and a trans woman. And I just see that and I think, I, I wonder what that will do. You know, I wonder how that will ripple out. I mm. wonder how that person who presents as this very, you know, big, strapping, masculine dude, you know, how is that going to ripple out when he leaves this space? Mm. Might he take something with him that makes a change in the world? Maybe that's terribly idealistic and uh, arrogant or naive of me I don't know but those moments I think those moments yeah have have the potential to make some magic out there and totally. so yeah 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 and I like so to I've, call them hopeful perhaps yes exactly you know. yeah um and so yes that's that's the kind of choice that I've consciously made the other thing that mm. I think possibly happens in those spaces particularly is I think about it as leveling the playing field a little bit <laughs> because right. the people who are privileged by those spaces as in the people we actively seek to cater to uplift listen to celebrate are not the same people who are catered to valued listened to and celebrated in the rest of our culture right now mm -hmm. so that is that is sort of the choice that i continue to make and then in terms of my client work increasingly i'm working with gsrd clients and that's just a privilege and a pleasure mm. yeah beyond words really and the book mm -hmm. I think the book was written in a very similar way to to that in which I run events, right? It's not mm -hmm. um, queer, queer exclusive, mm -hmm. but it is written very much by a queer person with queer people in mind. And mm -hmm. I don't know how you have found the language so far. I hope you found that reflected in there. But, you know, there is mm -hmm. certain language that, has traditionally uh, been the sort of mainstay or mainframe of books on this subject on this sort of if if we were to sort of you know clumsily call it conscious sexuality right um mm -hmm. there is certain language that's been the mainstay of that field and of those books that is not in my book for a reason mm -hmm. so yeah making making similar choices i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you make such a good point about it 
not being queer exclusive actually because you can almost go from from one binary to another to be like having all the binary and society at large being exclusive like excluding of queer Mm -hmm. folks and then although queer spaces are definitely needed as you said oh yes it can also get to a stage where you're like that is an exclusivity in and of itself but it's so important to also have a place where we all meet in not in the middle necessarily like in the in the galaxy of whatever it is especially <laughs> um, right now to, yeah right especially yeah yeah right to have now. those conversations and be yeah like yeah it's about coming together and I think yeah celebrating is such a great word totally yeah. and celebrating differences and also what we have in common and discovering more of who we are and yeah yeah and I think there's probably also a certain amount of queering that happens in those spaces as well yes. um and of yeah. yes uh us us <laughs> um inviting people over to the rainbow side um but there's yes. also something else in what you just said and this is where this is a large part of where my next book is coming from mm-hmm. which is that i think right now my sense is we cannot afford any more fracturing. Mm. We cannot afford any more fracturing within our communities and we cannot afford any more fracturing within this human species, human animal, um, human whole that we are part of. And... Mm -hmm what I'm one of the things that I'm really interested in in what I'm writing at the moment which is very much about what are the what are the alternatives and antidotes to the ways that a culture of disposability is bleeding into our relationships and inevitably into how we treat each other right Mm. what are the alternatives to that and one of the things I'm really interested in is how do how do we have conversations? How do we cross those bridges? How do we stay stay with the trouble, um, as Donna Haraway might say? You know, how do we stay with the trouble in the spaces between us? Because we can't afford to keep splitting off. Mm-hmm. Because we have shit to do, and we need to work out how to do that shit together. Yeah, absolutely. And it it is interesting because I think you see more and more people. It's almost like people are coming off the fence and not necessarily taking sides, but more Mm -hmm. like standing for something, whatever that is, and kind of maybe owning it more, you know. But there's also, I think it's almost like you have to get off the fence to be able to meet in that middle space. Because some people might think being on the fence is that middle space, but it isn't. No. It's like an outside space. You know, that's that's how I'm envisioning it at the moment. Yeah. 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 Um, it's more of that pleasing, perfecting and performing piece, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's sitting yeah. on the fence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it is interesting because like as a recovering people pleaser... I've, I'm very much, um, yeah, doing, as, doing as a the, little, of, the little, yeah, the little gay little. hands of recognition, <laughs> little gay jazz hands of recognition Yay. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a thing, isn't it? And that, I think being in that place is, it is like worried about getting it wrong, making mistakes, saying the wrong oh, yeah. thing, trying to please everyone, you know, and, um, yeah, it's so important to actually break through that. And be like, no, actually, you know, boundaries is something I'm learning about now. Mm. And part of me is a bit like, wow, you know, you're 49 years old and you're just learning about boundaries. But I'm like, well, yeah, I'm just, I've never been taught how to set them and communicate them in a healthy yeah. way. So I'm, I'm learning it now. Yeah. And that's, that's okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not just okay. It's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's linked with so many things, like uh, how we express ourselves and how, like the space we take up in the world, how we own our sexuality, yeah. like, you know, kicking through, kicking out shame and all that. Oh, yeah, there's so much to it. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Or insisting that we have the right to be with people that we can speak our shame to safely. Totally. Yeah, because it is in there. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's part of us, really. Yeah, totally. Insisting that we have the right to be seen and witnessed and held mm. as we share our shame and any other aspect of us. Mm. Yeah. I'm sure Brene Brown would agree. <laughs> I hope so. I hope. I hope um, <laughs> yes. uh, Saint, yeah. Saint Brene is is nodding, nodding wisely. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, oh, bless that woman for giving us so much excellent language, so yes. much excellent language to communicate this stuff to each other. My goodness. Yeah. So just thinking a bit more about, obviously we've covered a little bit about it already, where the sex witch comes in, like sex magic and ritual and things like that, which is, you know, which your book is full of the juiciness of it. So, yeah, shall we talk a bit more about that? Do you feel like there's anything more to add about oh, that? Oh, yes, let me see, because we have touched on it, you yeah. know, in that sense that it, it goes back a long way. And so... Where, for example, that word queer doesn't exist in the one of the two languages I grew up in, right? That is a newer term mm. in terms of the sort of timeline. That sex, we, sex witch piece, I, I probably didn't call it that at the time, but it, it does go very much back to the start. Um, so let me see, is there anything else that I can touch on? Yes, um, I can say a little bit more about the whys of sex and magic and magic and sex. Mm -hmm. um, and then a little bit more about what it means specifically for me, how I, mm -hmm. how I particularly view it and teach it, which is a little bit different from mm -hmm. how it might traditionally have been taught. So yeah. sex and magic, magic traditionally thought of as the manipulation of natural forces in accordance with one's will mm -hmm. and usually me needs usually needs a nice big burst of energy right mm -hmm. usually requires requires to be fed requires to be fed with energy or exhaustion which can be raised you know those those magical altered states in which we do ritual traditionally we could access those through something physical so dancing intense sensation or deal we could access them through some an intense emotional experience you know cracking open big grief big crisis you know that is mm -hmm. actually a very potent place to do magic in um mm -hmm. or you know the breath visualization meditation those things that we culturally associate more with the sort of spiritual aspect right and mm -hmm. Of course, the thing about sex is, and particularly sex that is intentional and consensual, is that it touches on, it incorporates, it invites in all of those aspects of ourselves, right? So you have mm -hmm. access to physical intensity and exertion, uh, rhythm. Hopefully you're using your breath, in comes your breath. And perhaps, you know, your your emotional self, your heart, you know, all of these all of these aspects of yourself are present as well. So it's mm. this really holistically perfect fit for this traditional model of magic. And there's there's a piece that Barbara always says about the fact that, you know, it also hopefully <laughs> It also hopefully feels great, and um, yeah. <laughs> you know she she found yeah. that surprisingly, unsurprisingly, um, where she just hadn't quite stuck with so many other spiritual practices, uh, she found it quite easy to come back to her sex magical practice, um, mm. easy and enjoyable. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of why sex for magic and then there are all these gifts that magic gives back to sex 
and if I if I think about the ways that I break down a ritual which you've been encountering in the book so you know the first one is creating safe and sacred space that invitation to actually carve out time and space rather than expect connection pleasure desire to arise spontaneously in the midst of our increasingly chaotic and busy existences yeah yeah I love how you say it's a practice rather than Mm -hmm. anything else Yeah, yeah 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 and then the piece around intention you know how is it to what would it be like to come towards erotic experiences with an explicit negotiated shared intention rather mm. than just sort of hoping hoping that we'll land on the same on the same page right i mean the same yeah. this, this, this same kind of conversations that bdsm has brought in increasingly to the erotic field right and then gifts like presence right learning the way that magical practice teaches us invites us to practice being present Mm. and the exquisite gift that presence is to any kind of connection including an erotic one so yeah there's this there's this beautiful uh synergy partnership this beautiful flow of gifts back and forth Mm -hmm. between sex and magic and then i guess the the thing to say about my practice and about how I teach this is that, so I, I sort of offered, you know, one traditional definition of magic, right? This idea of manipulating natural forces in accordance with one's will. And there's a sense in that of having power over something. Mm-hmm. But for me, the way that my practice and that my own journey with this work has evolved is one in which I'm seeing it less as power over and more as power with. So Mm -hmm. I see sex magic less as a demand that is imposed upon the universe and more as a dialogue between me and the cosmos or and or my deep self and or the goddess of my understanding right depending on Mm -hmm. who I am and what my beliefs are and and the uh, who I've invoked to support me in my working Mm -hmm. but yes for me it is a crucible for that dialogue and for an emergent understanding that I am not alone because I was I was raised in an environment that really left me with you know, this sense of being like a born coper, right? It's all on me. I've got this. I've got to do it. I've got to sort it out. Again, I think that that sense of isolation, goodness, particularly in the last couple of years, right, is so acute for so many people right now, especially the the recovering Mm -hmm. people pleasers among us. You know, I've got to do it. I've got to take it all on my shoulders. You know, it's so so alluring in a culture where, stress is is considered you know a positive attribute or a value or a sign that you're getting things right you know the more stressed you are Mm. better you're doing so this is really an antidote to that this sense that actually I'm in relationship I'm not alone and it helps (laughs) something about ritual structure particularly the way that I teach it and particularly with the very key component of surrender Mm. It serves as a constant reminder that just as in a spell, right, just as in a magical working or a ritual, I have set my intention and based on that intention, I've decided on some steps I'm going to take, on some tools I'm going to use, some ways that I'm going to raise energy and then release it, whatever it's going to be. And then, and then it's done then it's done. You know, mm-hmm. these these words that are so often used in, in witchcraft, and so it is, so mote it be, it is done. It's done. And mm-hmm. it, a really key component of the ritual is the bit where I go, it's done. Thank you. And I rest. I sit back. I receive. I surrender. Um, so just as mm-hmm. that happens in that ritual working, it reminds me, yes, these things are mine to attend to today. 
and tomorrow is mm -hmm. out of my hands. Tomorrow is not in my hands. And because of the, the personal relationship that I have with the goddess of my understanding, you know, tomorrow is in benevolent hands, mm -hmm. is, is my understanding. And these practices help mm -hmm. me to come into communion with her and mm -hmm. communicate, you know, well, this is what I'd love tomorrow to look like. But also I've learned from experience that you know, you are like an annoying best friend who knows better than yeah. I uh, what is good for me. So it's in your hands, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 You mentioned like intention, you know, in, in the book as well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is that is so underrated. I do. I do it. I set intentions <sighs> for my podcast recordings. You know, I do. Yes, that. we spoke and about I that feel when like, we first yeah, that's something spoke I and do I was just of. like, oh, yes, great. Yeah. This is going to work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Magic. Yeah. Intention totally. intention totally. is the yeah. most important piece of the magical pie for me. It's hard to say that given mm. given that I think surrender is absolutely the medicine that we all need right now, but if I was pushed to pick one component of of that sort of uh ritual recipe if you like Mm -hmm. Intention is the one I would have to pick because what I notice with intention is it's the great transformer. And I notice mm -hmm. this from a number of different aspects. One is I notice what intention does to everything from a difficult conversation through to an erotic encounter, right? The way that it, it turns an uncomfortable conversation into a meaningful and generative and transformative one. The way that if I set an intention, say we're going into a piece of conflict and I let you know what my intention is, the way that that gives us a much better chance of being on side, of, of going through this together rather than going through it in opposition. And yes, the mm -hmm. way that intention transforms a touch, an encounter, transforms whatever, whatever we mean when we're talking about sex. Yeah, intention is the great transformer. And I also notice that so often I see this for myself, I see this for my clients. So often, once an intention is set and articulated, the the wheels of the cosmos have started turning before we've even had a chance to do any magic for it. Intention mm. has already planted that seed out there and mm. something is already happening or already happens without us ever needing to yeah. bring that intention into a ritual crucible yeah intention intention mm. is the great intention is magic in itself right mm -hmm. absolutely yes yeah. yeah yeah beautiful so talking a bit about magic and ritual mm -hmm. i believe there is something you wanted to do <laughs> <gasps> that is yes yeah we could do that absolutely so yeah when we were first speaking and we were feeling into look, you know, scrutinizing our diaries, having a think about when we might have this conversation, the possibility of it being released yeah. around the winter solstice came up, uh, which really spoke to my witchy self and mm. planted the seed in me of, of possibly offering your wonderful listeners a little guided ritual. And I realized yeah. that we meant to say at the start, and perhaps you'll put this in the introduction, uh, to invite mm -hmm. people to bring a candle, uh, bring something to light it with, bring something for your candle to sit in or on. And yeah, let's go into that now. So let's do it. I'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little introduction to what we're doing. And then um, delightfully, you have agreed to be guided through this on behalf of the listeners. Mm hmm. So this, this little um, offering, this little ritual is inspired by the fact that we are journeying now into the dark heart of the year and the fact that I'm also aware that so many of us feel like we are in the dark at the moment and so many of us have, more of us I think, have felt in the dark at times over the last couple of years than usual or perhaps more of us are speaking about it so just yeah mm -hmm. acknowledging that and at a time when 
Now this is a time of year when we tend to really focus on the light, on festivities, on indulgence, on celebrating in the face of the dark. And I, I do want to say, you know, I'm a, I'm a great lover of those, those midwinter festivities. Uh, one of my favourite Christmas songs is Tracy Thorne's Joy, which really speaks to this. Or at least it was my favourite mm-hmm. until Grace Petrie came out with a version of Fairy Tale of New York, uh, which if folks haven't listened to, I thoroughly recommend. But what I wanted to do, <laughs> what I wanted to do this evening is to turn that on its head a little bit and instead invite us to explore how it is to really turn towards, to greet the dark, to go into the dark with an open heart. And I'm inspired, um, I came across a poem recently by Wendell Berry, which goes like this, to go in the dark with a light is to know the light, to know the dark, go dark, go without sight, and find that the dark too blooms and sings and is travelled by dark feet and dark wings. So that's my intention with this little ritual, this little bit of um, queered candle magic, if you like. So I'm going to guide nice. you. Th- I'm going to guide you through it in real time, but also mindful of of the length of the podcast, the length of the offering that we're working with here. So, folks listening at home, mm-hmm. you can pause the recording as and when you wish to. If you want a little bit more time at any point, I'm also going to be inviting Esther to do this with a single candle. But you could also do this with multiple candles, with multiple wishes. Um, And, you know, if you're really creative, you could take time to anoint those candles or to draw pretty pictures on them or to do whatever you like. This is a very pared down, simplified, guided meditation version of what this could be. Mm -hmm. Shall we dive in? Let's dive. Wonderful. Okay, so please have your candle to hand, have a way to light it, have something for it to sit on or in. And if, dear listeners, you can do so easily and safely, take a moment to close your curtains, to turn off any electric lights, and to come and sit with me in the dark. So I'll give you a moment to do that. So let's breathe. Welcoming the breath into the body as if you're embracing an old friend you haven't seen in far too long. Welcoming a breath that is deeper, that is fuller than your breath perhaps usually is. Feel free to start with a few big luxurious inhales and big sighs out. Welcoming the breath and with the breath, welcoming yourself into your own skin. Breath by breath, let go of the outer space, the space around you of its sights and sounds and textures and smells. Breath by breath, releasing that external space from your awareness. And breath by breath, breathing yourself in, inviting yourself in, traveling into your inner space. Making space for yourself in your body with the breath.
Take a moment to acknowledge your mind, to notice, to witness, to welcome whatever is up on the surface of yourself in this moment. Breathing into acknowledging those thoughts. And as you breathe out, letting them soften. Paying some attention to your physical self, to your body. Noticing whether there are any areas that are calling for your attention for some breath. Any areas of tension, breathing into those, breathing some space, some spaciousness into them. Breathing out inviting them to soften. And noticing the places where your body comes into contact with the space that you're in and really exhaling, exhaling into that support allowing yourself, allowing your body to be supported, to be soft, to be safe. And now as you breathe, as you continue to breathe that deeper, fuller breath, turning your breath and your attention towards your heart space, wherever that's sitting in your body for you today. Supporting your heart with the breath and settling into your heart with your attention. And just taking a moment to breathe, to attend to whatever is moving is moved within your heart space today. And now I'm going to offer a question and I invite you to just let that question drop into your heart space, like a pebble, into a pool. What is your heart's wish at this time? What is your heart longing for? What is your heart wishing for? What is your heart's wish at this time? And as your wish takes shape in your heart, allow it to fill your attention. Get curious with your wish. Notice what is its shape. How, where, when might this wish 
be fulfilled? What would its fulfillment look like? And most importantly, perhaps, how would the fulfillment of that wish make you feel? Really allowing that feeling to blossom in your heart space. As you reflect on your wish, pick up your candle. And staying in that inner space, just let your hands hold or caress or pass your candle back and forth between them. As that feeling of your wish coming true blossoms within you. We're going to take three full deep breaths and really let that vision, that feeling expand during these deep breaths and overflow from your heart into your whole body, your whole being. So breathing in and out. And in. And out. And now holding your candle in your hands, we'll take three deep breaths to focus on your candle, to breathe your vision into it. Taking those three deep breaths in your own time and imagine as you breathe that vision flowing from you into your candle like light or colour, like warmth or sparkles, like the rhythm of your heartbeat or a rush of emotion. Feeling your vision emptying out of you and filling up your candle. And when you're ready, light your candle and say, so be it. And I'm just going to give you a moment here to sit, to watch that candle flame. opening your eyes again to do so, to bask in the lingering feeling of your wish coming true. And the knowledge that your wish is a light now, it is alive in the world, it has been heeded by the universe, it is in the hands of the mystery. So taking a moment to sit, to breathe with, to witness the shining light that is your wish in the world.
And now it's time to let your wish go, to surrender, to release it into the pulsing, singing, dreaming dark of the year. So when you're ready and willing to cross that threshold, blow out your candle. Sit in the dark and breathe. You can place warm, loving hands on your body if you wish to. Sit in the dark and breathe. As you sit in the dark, notice your heart beating. And notice that your heart is held, is cradled, is resting in a much greater heart, a vast vessel of love that is also beating. As you breathe in, drink deep of the love that is here for you. As you breathe out, let your heart rest. Let your heart rest in the dark heart of the year. As you rest in the dark, if you have a sense of or a personal relationship with any ancestors or guides or gods or other unseen beloveds, listen for their presence. Notice that even here, in the dark, in the dark of the year, in the dark of uncertainty, they are here with you. Their presence, their guidance, their holding is available to you. Breathe in their love. And as you breathe out, let yourself be held, held. As you are held in the dark, notice that beneath the space that you are in, beneath the building, beneath the foundations of the building that you are in, somewhere beneath you there is the earth, the wintering, sleeping, dreaming earth. And notice that even now, in this winter time, the ever-present welcome of the earth rises up through the space to greet your body and all that your body is holding. Remember that you are part of the earth's dream, 
that the earth is dreaming of you with love. Breathe in that ever-present welcome. Breathe out and here and now, in the dark heart of the year, let yourself be loved. listeners you can take all the time you need here and Esther I'm going to very gently invite you to begin to reconnect with your senses with your sense of the physical space that you're in maybe wriggle your fingers and toes take a deep breath or two breathing yourself back into the here and now opening your eyes last of all Wow. I need some tissues. <laughs> mm -hmm. Take your time. Welcome back. Oh, yeah. How are you? I am good. That was really, that was really beautiful. And it felt really loving and sacred. It was really, really lovely space. Beautiful space. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Well, that was all rather delicious, wasn't it? Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah, how lovely. Yeah, it feels like we're on this very, very lovely, mellow, mellow note. So do you have anything to add before we wrap up our conversation? Is this a good time for me to say something about where folks can find me? And what I can, what I can offer. Absolutely, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, All right, totally. folks. Yes. Um, well, if you would like to uh, enjoy more of the intersections, enjoy and explore for yourselves the intersections of sex and magic from the comfort of your own home, you might, you might enjoy doing that in company with a copy of my book which is called Igniting Intimacy, Sex Magic Rituals for Radical Living and Loving. It's available in, mm -hmm. you know, all the usual evil places. But if you happen to have a local queer or alternative or feminist bookstore, you know, maybe encourage them to uh, get in a copy for you. Yeah, and use this as a way to support them. From January, I will have two slots available in my psychosexual coaching practice. Uh, so if you are looking for a safe, a welcoming space in which to explore any of the difficult questions about love, sex, gender, um, boundaries, consent, desires, uh, identity, expressing those things, exploring those things, um, embodying, empowering those aspects of yourself, then please do get in touch. You can find uh, my practice at makinglovewithgod.co.uk. Uh, there's that, that relationship, that relationship piece that we talked about before. Uh, in the title of the website mm -hmm. and my practice is obviously hopefully by now queer celebrating is kink and non-monogamy positive is rooted in uh, ever unfolding understanding of oppression and an awareness of how it is to to exist to uh, be alive in a capitalist culture so yes, you're very mm. welcome to find me there. Uh, 
Uh, and if you're interested in events that I run, uh, for example, the last couple of years, I have run a virtual course called Sex Magic for Our Times, which is a combination of exploring the components of ritual magic uh, while also staying with the trouble of these times that we are living through personally and collectively. Um, so if you're interested mm -hmm. in events that I run, you can join my mailing list via the website or another really good way to keep abreast of stuff is to follow me on Facebook. Uh, it's Making Love with God again on there as well. Uh, and yeah, Wonderful. I look forward to encountering some of you perhaps uh, further down the line. Indeed. And I look forward to welcoming yeah. you, Esther, when you're ready to come along oh, to, absolutely. to one of my yeah. spaces. Really looking forward to that. I would love to. Absolutely love to. Yeah. Wow. Well, that was magical, I think. Yeah. Yay. Thank it's you been... so much for being a guest and sharing with me. Oh, yeah. it's such, such a pleasure and a delight to be invited. Um, yeah. <laughs> may, may the conversation Yay. be as magical for the listener um, as it has been for us. Absolutely. Yeah. You can find out more details on the website at 50shadesofgender.com forward slash Rowan, which is R-O-W-A-N, where you can also read the transcript. And you can find Rowan on their website, makinglovewithgod.co.uk and on Facebook at MLWGod. Thank you for listening to the 50 Shades of Gender podcast. You can find us online at 50shadesofgender.com, on social media and on YouTube. Again, if you'd like to support us, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon visit patreon.com forward slash 50 shades of gender or buy us a coffee. Links are on the website. We hope you will listen again. Until then, stay curious and open-minded. Ah, oh, just basking in the... Ah, okay. Yeah, the after, the afterglow of that, that ritual. I just mm. feel like, ah, oh, I feel like I'm in this like soft blanket. <laughs> Oh, it was so lovely. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs>